Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. Visit us at IHateCritics.com, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is Critics Pod. Or on YouTube as well. Click on the little bell up in the corner to subscribe to the channel and get notifications when uh, we release a new episode. We're on an Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Alexa, Stitcher. Subscribe to the show, rate and review the show. We'll try to review, read your reviews on the air. And then Patreon, patreon.com slash criticspod. The best way to help support the podcast. You can also get there by going to ihatecritics.com. There's a link up in the top. Uh, as well as a T Public link for our merchandise. You can get our t shirts, our masks, our pillows, whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, some pretty funny looking masks, so. <laughs> I figure if we're ever going to sell one, it's going to be the William. If we're ever going to sell the Willem Dafoe Wiener one, it'll be on the mask. <laughs> uh. But before we get going, uh, there was a little news, kind of a sad day yesterday. Both, yeah, this, go this year, go go jump on a river. I hate this year. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah, Fred Willard passed away, as well as uh, indie director Lynn Shelton. Uh, she was only fifty four, I think. Yeah, just came out of nowhere, apparently. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's. Like, the coronavirus hasn't really scared me yet, but just all of a sudden people... Because neither one of these are coronavirus stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of the... There's been a couple of nights this week alone, I've just been like, I could just not wake up tomorrow. I'm a big guy. I'm in my 40s. You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. It's always it's just weird when you start reading that stuff. And I can see why people go down a rabbit hole and get... I mean, I, I'm not worried about it, but uh, it's just... I don't know. Just what do you say? Yeah, what do you say in this situation? Uh, the you know the work stands for itself. We're going to talk a lot about Lynn Shelton uh, next week, uh, uh, kind of a tribute episode. And uh, so Fred Fred Willard. Uh, I mean, I don't think I don't think there's anything any comic performance uh, I've seen that's as funny as perhaps su- supporting performance as his turn in, in Best in Show. That character is he gets a laugh every time he talks (laughs) every (laughs) single time he says a word in that movie, he gets a laugh. It is, uh, I mean, everybody, everybody who's ever done an announcer gig after that has been basically, you're getting a laugh. You're doing him like Jason Bateman and and dodgeball. That's just basically cribbed a lot of what Fred Willard did in best in show. Yeah, that's so true. But yeah. He's absolutely. That's my. That's the one that stands out for me in terms of his performances. There's, there's a million of them, and he always turns up, and he always gets a big laugh. But that, that's the one for me that I'll, I'll never forget. Yeah, just a weird sad day, and we haven't really done really anything with Lynn Shelton on the show, so that's why next week's going to be dedicated to her in a lot of ways. Uh, we have at least two movies we're going to watch. We'll see how right. where our mood takes us. Uh. But anyway, we can get started with this week and start with the Happy Madison film, The Wrong Missy. Yes, The Wrong Missy with uh, David Spade and Lauren Lapkus. Uh, The story goes that this uh, businessman, uh, played by David Spade, uh, meets a woman named Missy on a blind date. She's Lauren Lapkus. She's terrible. She's loud. She's crude. She's weird. She's very off-putting. He uh, attempts to escape this date and leave her behind forever and uh, not long after that, he meets another woman named Missy, uh, played by Molly Sims, a uh, swimsuit model. Uh, they they hit it off. They have a good time, uh, and seems like they could have uh, a re- potential for a relationship. Uh, then he uh, decides to invite her on a corporate uh, getaway to Hawaii, but uh, he ends up accidentally texting the wrong Missy, and uh, Lauren Lapkus shows up and goes up goes to Hawaii with him and uh, and hijinks and sue uh i don't like this movie uh i like <laughs> her i like laura lapkus a lot i think she's really funny but I, I just don't i what i don't know what it is about david spade the guy i just don't connect with him in anything that he does uh i don't find him to be an appealing presence i don't see that that uh, why anybody would find him 
terribly attractive. He's not particularly charismatic. He's not particularly funny I'm, as a character in a movie, the David Spade character, because I don't know the man. I don't know anything about him other than he's <laughs> supposed to be a comedian. Uh, he's never wow. made me laugh. <laughs> he's, he's never made me laugh. I, I know he's a comedian. I know that's what he does right I know. now. He's never made me laugh uh, since uh, SNL. I, I mean, it's just, I don't know if it's just his, his manner or what. It's just not my not my style of comedy. And uh, I just don't buy him as being appealing enough to, to take either of these two women or Sarah Chalk, who plays his ex wife or girlfriend in the movie. Yeah, uh, my wife said the same thing, and I was like, well, in real life, <laughs> that's all he dates is <laughs> supermodels who are 20 years younger than him. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it's a Happy Madison movie. I mean, it's it's as watchable as any of them are, but it, it's also there's a bit of goofiness where you're just kind of taken out of it here and there. And, you know, she's fun in it. But, I mean, she even has her moments where it's just like, okay, like, I mean, you might as well put Adam Sandler in there. It's the same thing he would do. Uh, you know, I mean, there's just some weird, stupid, and it's not her fault. It's a script. I can, I can see where this character almost has has elements of uh, Jill from Jack and Jill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but she goes all in, which is kind of yeah. fun, especially early on. Uh and but again, it just it comes back to you've seen all these movies. They're all kind of the same movie, so I get why people like them, but I also get why people hate them. And I, I just I'm it's neither the, here there nor there. It's the same, you know, silly, ridiculous uh, kind of male fantasy of a woman that that mm-hmm. uh, that Sandler always creates. Uh, Sandler's people always create uh, these characters. That he, he not to blame Sandler for this. He's just a producer, I'm sure, but. Uh, the, but the, somehow the, all these movies that he's part of or his company is part of, they, they create these same female characters. They're always the, that super cool chick who, you know, hey, no, it's cool. I want to have a three-way with your ex-girlfriend. I totally – and I only want to have sex with you. And like, <laughs> all these things that could just – that just feel completely unnatural. And I don't know what kind of magnetism Spade has off away from the movies, but in movies I don't sense any of that type of – uh, magnetism that would draw women to him in the way that they are drawn to him in movies. And yeah, you know, the same goes for Sandler. A lot of the time, I don't understand why any woman like Chuck and Larry and Jessica Biel, like she just seems like she's way better than him. Why would she even talk to this guy? <laughs> and that's the thing <laughs> that these characters keep getting created for this type of movie is that these guys who are just these women who are just so tolerant and so accepting of whatever is just directly in front of them. And it takes it takes me out of the reality of it every single time. Yeah, I mean, the the whole Happy Madison group is almost like a little frat of like, you know, not jocks, but like intramural jocks, you know. <laughs> and, you know, they live in their own little bubble, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that that bubble has kind of controlled the world for a while. <laughs> and so it, it just gets annoying. So I, I, I've never... Like, the only reason I defend it on the show is just, like, it's more of a, we really shouldn't even be talking about this half the time. But in this particular <laughs> instance, you know, there is a little more to talk about because she is quite good. Early yeah. on, there's some fun stuff. When he, the Roman Reigns bit, I enjoyed that. That was that was neat. Uh, it just, it just kind of slowly turned into what it's always been. But I, I interviewed her this week about this movie, and, and she is just an absolute delight. Uh, Lori Lapkus, just uh, she's the best podcast guest going you know, in terms of like if you like the uh, uh, improv comedy uh, podcast, she's the best there is at it. She one of the one of the best in the world at uh, inventing podcast characters. And and she does what she can with this. She goes all out. She throws herself all the way into it to the point where you almost you do kind of almost feel for her character at the end because she's just that strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just I kept Spade just kept kind of getting in my way. Yeah, I don't know how great Spade is at improv. I mean, he just he it's weird because he always kind of plays that kind of semi arrogant character uh, without having a reason to be arrogant. Uh, <laughs> And I guess that alone is kind of funny, but that's that's really all he's ever done in a movie. I mean, his, SNL was okay. He was better there. 
I don't yeah. know. I I don't dislike him. I I'm neither here nor there. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's got zero rage. He's David Spade in everything. Even Joe Dirt is just an outsized you know, David Spade. Uh, there's nothing. There's and I. You can't so, say what anything he even does seems like acting. It's just the regurgitating lines. You know, that are kind of loosely contained into a story. And yeah, I uh, I I don't find that appealing. Yeah, even this. I mean, I would say this and Joe Dirt are his biggest as most wide range away from him and that's not saying much <laughs> uh, but it is watchable it's easy to get through I don't want to get into people's personal appearance in any way I'm not trying to, to denigrate the man's appearance but I was distracted by his hair the entire time what's he doing with his hair I don't understand was that a piece or is it just the color was wrong I don't know it was weird <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it was an attempt to make him look more just like your everyday guy. But I, I, I don't know. I'm, tr- I'm guessing. I, I really have no idea what they were going for. But I agree with you. It didn't. It stuck out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Anything else on the wrong, Missy? Uh, Nick Swordson is a plague on this planet. And needs to go away as well. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing is. The joke got old every time yeah. David Spade sent a text. He got he read it. And it was like, okay, that's now you're taking me out of the movie. I understand why you think this is funny in the writers' room, but when you start to show it on screen and he see, you know, because he's the HR guy and he he has no privacy. I don't know. It's just a joke that got old, and that's the problem with most Happy Madison movies is they just kind of go for this joke and they never let it go, and you just kind of you can't invest yourself. Indeed. All right. Uh, did you, you watch any of those documentaries? You watched the acid one, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. All right. Have a good trip. Adventures in psychedelics. Uh, this is a documentary that is about uh, exploring celebrity uh, acid trips, uh, talking to uh, famous people about the times that they uh, dropped acid or uh, and. and what what their trip was like and trying to get to the heart of what it's like to trip and what it means to people and things that happen, a good trip, a bad trip. It's got some uh, satirical takes on kind of classic uh, acid propaganda that are really funny, but everything <laughs> about this is really, really well put together and quite funny and, and fascinating. Uh, I, I really loved every aspect of this. Uh, Nick Offerman is kind of your host to uh, yeah, you know, just kind of does a couple of skits here and there, introduces things, holds it together, and uh, I I wanted this to go on all day. I wanted this to be three or four or five hours long of just people, really cool people, telling fun stories about the times they took acid and people kind of vaguely acting them out. It was like a, a it was like a drunk history for for right. <laughs> for the trips. <laughs> that is so true. And it's weird. I mean, you're completely sober, and I, I pretty much just a drink. I'm not really a drug person at all. Uh, but it kind of made me like, I'd, I'd try this, depending on the right scenario. This movie kind of took me there, uh, and it's something I never, never really even thought about. I had a friend in high school who was all about it, and we were just like, no, that's stupid. Quit being an idiot. But this movie <laughs> just makes it, I mean, it's not making it sound fun, but it, it it makes it sound interesting and you know, there's a lot of funny stories, a lot of scary stories, but there's also like educational information here and they <laughs> kind of dig into Timothy Leary a little bit. Uh-huh. And I found it kind of fascinating personally. Oh, it, it, it is. Like I said, I wanted to go on for a while. Uh, I, I've never taken any type of drugs. I've always been okay with other people doing it. Uh, I, and it, I don't, I don't put myself above, people right. who do uh because it's it's mostly for me just a, a an extension of a high level insecurity i have mm-hmm. uh than anything else uh, and asthma keeps me from ever using pot right uh so but I, i'm fascinated by mushrooms i have been ever since uh bill hicks back in the day when he was do, when he would do his bits about being on lsd just some of the greatest comedy of all time <laughs> <laughs> i just he's a there's a small piece of uh of his uh comedy do, talking about LSD and about how 
the, you know, they never talk about the positive side of LSD, which is <laughs> uh, true. Nobody, nobody's ever talked about really until this pod, until this uh, documentary came along. There's like rarely does anybody talk about the positive side of it. There is a positive side of it. Uh, yeah, these people just kind of busily exploring their imaginations, and that that's uh, that was my favorite part. Uh, and then, of course, there's the propaganda stuff, which is great. There's this <laughs> '80s '80s t- uh, TV after school special parody with uh, Adam Scott, and uh, that was fantastic. I loved every. <laughs> they kept jumping out the windows. <laughs> <laughs> That was a big thing in the '80s. Apparently, right. they had like, this thing, or seven, maybe all the way back to the '60s, probably. Well, if you use if you use LSD, you're going to end up jumping out, out a window, <laughs> and that's one of the things that that uh, Bill Hicks talked about on his on his uh, stand up specials back in the day. Is like uh, he doesn't care if the guy jumps out the window. Why, if he thought he could fly, why didn't he take off from the ground? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And then the whole, just the whole stings in it, taking it totally serious. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of funny, funny in its own right, because he's not really making jokes. Uh, and then Nick Offerman is, I mean, he's not in it much, but when he is, he just lands everything he says. I don't know. Like, you're right. This could be five hours long, and I'd still be enjoying it. Yeah, the cast is wonderful. Anthony Bourdain is, uh, you know, kind of bittersweet right. uh, seeing him there. But Carrie Fisher uh, too. Oh yeah, Carrie Fisher. Oh my God, she was incredible, wasn't she? Mm-hmm. Oh, what a what a babe. I mean, just just so cool. <laughs> she's just like she's like she felt more real on acid than she did in everyday life, and I love that they examined that from a scientific perspective as well. Like the, why that makes complete sense. Uh, and just the story that she tells about about being topless on the beach and running into a bunch of tourists while she's just like completely the, stoned out of her head at the height of Princess Leia, on, no <laughs> less. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that totally makes sense. I don't know. It, it was just it was a really good watch. It was fun. It was smart, educational. I don't know. It. I don't know if you have any mushrooms. Let me know. <laughs> I would definitely consider it under the right circumstances. Yeah, that would be my main concern. A friend of mine, we like his property would be a good place, and then you're like, well, there's a big lake. <laughs> 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 it makes me a little nervous. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, but yeah. <laughs> Check that one out. I mean, we're not going to talk about it, but uh, the Michelle Obama Becoming, thats I enjoyed that too. It's not really a documentary as much as it follows her book tour. Uh, yeah they're both on netflix and it just kind of gives you a good inside look into her and you know it is kind of heartbreaking at times and it's cool to see these figures in real life and not you know on this pedestal that they can't you know compete with you know i don't know it's just very interesting i couldn't bring myself to watch it i'm just too i'm too bummed out by politics these days to even think about looking at anything like mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> well this will bum you out more I, I know that's not like really necessarily political uh, but I, anything that reminds me of politics I just try to avoid at the moment just because it's right. all too sad right now yeah and they're trying to put politics on everything <laughs> which is yeah. even worse but no it, it, there's parts in it where it'll just kind of bum you out even more uh, so I'll <laughs> Because, I mean, there's literally a part in the movie where she's like, after eight years, you know, we made America do this. They voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. You know, why, what did we do wrong kind of thing? And it was pretty heartbreaking. Uh, but it, it it does give you a good inside look into the person and not, you know, the character or the, or the persona, uh, which I enjoyed a lot. And I wish you would run for president, but that'll never, <laughs> ever, ever happen. Uh, Does she say that in the movie? She's never going to do it? No, but I read the book, too, and it just, uh, there's, I I can see why she would never do it. I mean, you can just see the look on their face as they're walking out of the White House, just kind of like, okay, now we can go back to what our new normal is. It'll never go back to the way it was, but now there's, now I don't have to be perfect all the time. I mean, I mean, think about that. The president, one thing, but now you're the first black president. You yeah. can't mess up. You know, Clinton could mess up. Reagan could mess up. You know, they, but when you're the, you know, 
you got a sudden example and you, you the microscope was scope was on them and i mean eight years of not missed making a misstep is hard <laughs> and I stressful and it, it really does bring you there and so when you're back in the politics mood uh <laughs> not, not really mood i know what you mean but when it's not bumming you out i i think you'll enjoy it uh dark side of the ring the road warriors yeah, I'm, I'm, we're really kind of running out of steam on this show. I just want to get to the Owen Hart episode now and just get this over with because this is this isn't any good anymore. Uh, <laughs> there's yeah. just not a lot. There's not a lot here with the Road Warriors. Uh, that you know, it's sad that that uh, one of them died, but uh, it wasn't nearly as dramatic as anybody thought it was. It was a sort of random and you know tragic, but still not particularly notably tragic um mm-hmm. I, I he didn't he, he died too young but you know most wrestlers do it would seem right uh but he he didn't die in the ring he didn't you know there's nothing he wasn't murdered it was just sort of sad and random uh and to top it off the wrestling that the that the road warriors did was never particularly interesting uh, they 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 call them game changers and all this stuff and yeah it's to a point, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, t- I guess to a certain to a certain generation this is uh, the height of uh, greatness and it's the last time any any tag team has been made to look as strong as they were. Uh, rarely does that ever happen anymore. Uh, right. The team walks through the door and they're named the champions and they just run around being champions wherever they go. Uh, they were booked strong, but they don't really have much insight into the fact that they were booked strong. No one talks about why or what they what made them so special. There's not no real insight into that. Uh, it's a series of stuff that happened, and then one of them dies too young. And uh, okay, yeah, I mean they they just don't dig into it. Like the WWE version, they have a documentary on the World Road Warriors, which and, and they sensationalize things and they re rewrite history, but they make it entertaining. And yeah. I'll argue that's one of the better documentaries on a wrestlers is the Road Warrior one that they did. This is I mean they're sensationalizing it more than it should be. But this there's good things here at times. I found out I mean I love the Road Warriors and I never even knew who they were. I mean I only knew them as Legion of Doom. So I didn't yeah. even know, but when they walked in, I was just like, "Yeah, these are my guys. They're cool. They're they just look neat." Uh, but uh, this whole thing was just, I guess, animal. You can kind of tell he still gets annoyed when he talks about Hawk, and you know, the manager. He's kind of somewhat compelling, but you know, I knew all these stories they told and they didn't even tell the best parts, you know, because they didn't have all the road warriors. Like when they're doing the scaffolding match, the best part is Jim Cornette jumped off and busted his knees out. Don't even mention that. The whole thing about the bar where they're doing each other's moves on Vince McMahon and the strip club, the Legion, (laughs) they didn't even do it fully. That was, you know, they kind of pretended to do the move and the Hart Foundation actually did the move and that was the story, but they don't, they left the best parts of both stories out. Because it didn't involve the Road Warriors. <laughs> and I think the only thing is that Animal wanted to make sure everybody knew that when Hawk died, he was clean and sober. And he accomplished that on the WWE one, and now he's accomplished it here. But that's all you're really getting out of this. And yeah. And the thing about it is, is that the times that he was using drugs are far more interesting than the times that he wasn't. Not to... I mean, not that I want to dwell on the ugliest parts of a guy's life, but it was far more interesting the time that he got, you know, he snuck drugs into North Korea, this guy. (laughs) (laughs) He went on the North Korea trip with WCW. Uh, Granted, this was while he was, he wasn't with uh, uh, Animal at the time. He was off on his own with WCW on this one, on this trip to North Korea, and he managed to sneak drugs in. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So he's like, I was a, that's a funny story. It's not one that they were going to tell, though, because, again, they, this is one of those things is investing in sort of burnishing a person's uh, life story as opposed to, uh, t- you know, telling the raw, and the real. Like, there's a really great story about Draws who a- a got added to the uh, Legion of Doom uh, during their WWE run. They didn't want him. And he was, you know, kind of, he was 
badly mistreated for that time, and they barely even get into that. Right. Like, but the other the WWE when they do, and I don't know. It, it's the cool thing about the show is when you know the Chris Benoit one. It, it's something that if you're not a wrestling fan and you watch it, you'd be compelled and interested in. Yeah. This one was an easy watch for me because I like the Road Warriors. But if you don't, you're you're going to turn the channel, and that's that's what's wrong with this episode. I think it, it doesn't. There's nothing that brings you in. Uh, there's nothing that would make somebody who's not a wrestling fan watch this. And hopefully next week's Owen Hart one, they hopefully. do it right. But they're only doing a one part, and I heard Martha on the Chris Jericho podcast, and she's all excited about it. But at the same time, she goes, I wish we had more time. We could, so we could have talked about this and this. And I don't know. I just hope it's done right. I, I have my doubts at this point because, I mean, this was like a, a bad uh, a bad biopic where the guy's still alive and is telling mm-hmm. them how to tell the story. Right. Yeah, that's very true. And, I mean, you could tell, like I said, Animal still has unresolved issues that they don't – they just kind of – it's there, but they don't dig into it. It's just yeah. surface level. And so I don't know. Basically, I guess the manager kind of comes off it was the most compelling one of all of them, but – I couldn't even remember his name. So Paul Ellery. Paul Ellery, yeah. that's right. They don't even go into him in the puppet. I was hoping to see this backstory behind him and bringing a puppet to the ring. They don't even get into it. I mean, that was funny. That was interesting. That was weird. Also, you know, you've got a natural place again to interview Jim Cornette, who's been the most compelling part of everything that they've done, and they don't do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Literally, the only episodes we've liked, he's been on. Right. And even last season, I, I, kind of the same thing. There was a few episodes that were good, and then the rest were kind of boring. And I, I almost feel like they need to spend, instead of having all these topics, if they do a season three, they need to only have like two or three and spread that across ten episodes or whatever it is so they can really dig into things because they're not. It, it's so yeah. surface level on everything that it's just not good enough. I don't know. And then have Cornette be the major part yeah. of it because he's a great storyteller. Just hire him to tell every story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he was there for most of them. <laughs> Those are really good ones. He was there anyway. I mean, he does like six hours of podcasts every week. So <laughs> 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 he's got the stories to tell. Uh, Jesus Rolls. <sighs> Jesus Rolls. Wow. What an absolute piece of garbage this is. Uh, this is uh, John Turturro directing a story uh, based off of the character that was created for the Big Lebowski, uh, Jesus Quintana. And, I mean, it, it, if, a, if a guy really didn't understand the character he was playing, that John Turturro did not understand the character he was playing in Lebowski. <laughs> He thinks that there was so much to Jesus in that movie. There's not. (laughs) He's a very small part of it. You get a strong sense of him, but he's also there as a character in The Big Lebowski. We'll get to that a little bit. About He's just there to help with the pace. He's there to to uh, to stop the story for a moment and give you something, give you kind of a, a laugh and a kind of a, you know, kind of a moment to just draw away from the the main story and then. Uh, we'll get back to it. It's a it's a side it's a sideline, and there's not a lot there there. And what John Turturro tries to bring to him here is just utter nonsense. That because most of it is trying to refer back to things that we saw in Lebowski. And dude, you're not even in the movie that long, <laughs> and it's so awkward. The whole thing is opens with Jesus is in prison, and for some reason we have to see him work out because you know John Turturro works out. I guess I don't know. Uh, there's a, a a Spanish band playing because, of course, there is. That's the music that was used for him with Lebowski. So, of course, yes. But those guys are in prison with him, and they're playing. They've got their guitars and they're playing, and he can hear it, or is it not? Not is it diegetic? Not di- I have no idea. But it's so awkward and weird that it does. Whether it makes sense, I guess, doesn't matter. Uh, he goes to see Christopher Walken, who's the uh, warden of the of the prison that he's in, and. Walken launches into the most awkward exposition dump I've seen in a long while. Like, oh, Jesus, you're in jail because of this, this, and this. 
And it's like, well, yeah, he knows why he's there. He also knows that he bowled on the prison bowling team, but you feel the need to tell him that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so awful. This is a terrible way to begin a movie. And then he he leaves prison finally. This is just the first three minutes that this movie has taken place. Well, yeah, let's not gloss over the fact that they finally they sh- they decide to show the part where he gets caught for you know exposing himself to an eight year old, yeah. uh, almost to make him look like he's innocent, which really annoyed me. Because oh, I- it was so bad. He turns to this child and basically shows the child his balls. <laughs> And they're trying to make it look like he's not doing it on purpose. I don't, I don't know. Either way, it's just a weird scene, and it takes it. Of, let me just let me lay that scene out because it is, again, this is a lot of really dumb shit that's happening. But the the idea here, he's trying to retcon Jesus' backstory. Because mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the Lebowski, they lay it out that he went to prison for exposing himself to an eight-year-old. And so they retcon that story into he's at a urinal. There's an eight-year-old boy at the urinal not far away. The the little boy looks at his penis and compliments about how large it is. And yeah. what, what kind of, what, <laughs> how do you think that this is going to work out well for you? Right. Yeah. And he's got to throw in the thing about how big his, how big his dick is, because that's really necessary information. Mm-hmm. We've all been wondering about that. That's just more of that awful ego stroking that he does throughout because you know every woman has to sleep with him but every man kind of wants to sleep with him too the whole sex stuff in this movie is utterly bizarre and everything is a visual reference back to lebowski and (laughs) yeah and the even the but like you said they're making him an ego thing but then he goes off and he can't he can't satisfy audrey tattoo's character marie and it doesn't I mean, uh, now now it's not funny. It's not. I don't know. It just it doesn't make sense what he's trying to do. I mean, basically, this is a remake of a movie called uh, uh, "Going Places," uh-huh. a French film with Gerard Depardieu, <laughs> and he just basically wanted to remake it with the Jesus character. Pretty much all he did, and it wasn't done well. And I don't know. It was boring. Uh, we kept leaving the room to go do not to do stuff, but like, you know, grab some chips or grab a drink or go to the bathroom or whatever it is and not pausing the movie. <laughs> so I missed the whole Pete Davidson part. <laughs> but my wife explained it and I got it. and We moved on. Yeah. Uh, didn't matter. It no. Didn't matter in any way. So. But it, everything like all the. The, the high level ego on John on John Turturro throughout this thing. He casts Sonia Braga as his mom. She's seven years older than he is. Right. She's all of seven years older than him. But he had to be his mom had to be this super hot woman who's you know only slightly older than him. But because they what to make you look slightly younger, like all this stuff that just he does repeatedly just to to show off his own ego and i think he thinks that he's showing off the ego of the jesus but no the, you're the director you're putting this in the context that it's in so this is about you it's not about the character yeah even if he's trying to make it about the jesus he it it, it it's not working and so and it is coming back and doing exactly what you said and then you watch, I mean, I haven't seen it, but Fading Gigolo seems to be a weird movie like this, too, with Woody Allen and Sharon Stone, and uh, where he has sex a lot. And that's just, I can't, um, I don't know, being in a movie that you direct and star in and then direct a sex scene is just so weird and creepy to me. Even if it wasn't, I can't separate that. I can't, it just is weird for me to... Because it's also very, I don't know, like you can see the hairs on their ass really. It's just a weird scene. And not, yeah. And to know yeah. that he's the one saying cut action, do this, do that, that's just awkward. Yeah, yeah it, it, it reminded me of, uh, of uh, have you seen The Brown Bunny? Uh, No, but I know about it. It reminds me a lot of that, uh, where you've got a director who has nobody telling him what to do, and he's just completely, uh, you know, just kind of burnishing his own ego and directing the ugliest of sex scenes. And right. But <laughs> because, least... hey, I'm the director, and everybody, you know, it's everybody has to do what I tell them to do. And 
and this may have been the most professional thing in the world. I'm not saying it wasn't. I, it just when you're watching it, it just feels weird. That's all I'm saying. But uh, the brown bunny was like an ex girlfriend, and that just. Uh. <laughs> It's no wonder, though, that John Turturro is uh, is a happy Madison guy, too. Uh, he's got a lot of their traits. Right. Uh, but he but he has. The, but the thing about it is that as much as I don't care for those guys, there is a complete lack of pretension to what they do. They know what they're doing. They know it's lowbrow. That's what they're going for. Turturro seems to think that I, I can do these lowbrow things, but I'm an artist while I do it. And screw you. No, you're not. You're, you're no better than Sandler. You are no better than Sandler. Right. Yeah, almost I, worse. Th- th- yeah, it, it's it's worse almost because this is so pretentious. Right. Because he thinks that what he's doing is brilliant. He thinks he's making this uh, you know, artsy, independent road picture that has this character that people love. And does anybody really care that much about the Jesus? I mean, <laughs> no. honestly, I mean, he's a fun character for like the two seconds he's there. Because of the two funny. seconds. <laughs> That's why, because you don't get enough of them. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's like that. You know, the the girl in the ring who then goes into the grudge, and every other horror movie since then. The more you see her, the less scary she <laughs> is. Uh, yeah, it was just a. I don't know. We were. Ho- I knew it wasn't going to be good. Yeah, and then no one's re- we're like, we're not having anything to do with this. And we did the we did a double feature of this in Lebowski and. Uh, at least there was something to save the night, but oh my god, it was so bad. This the the sex of this movie. You talked about the sex that he has with women, but he's also into men apparently. And there's this weird, awkward cuts between him and uh, Bobby Cannavale, where like one minute they're like they seem to be in bed together, spooning, but then the next minute Bobby Cannavale's going all no homo. Like make up your mind. Either you two are kind of having a romantic thing or you're not. I don't, I don't care. And then the John Hamm shows up, and he's a hairstylist, and that's the joke. I'm a hairstylist. Right. <laughs> what, did, what did this add to anything? You could be any, you could be some dude off the street. It doesn't matter. But no, I'm a hairstylist, dude. You don't understand. I'm a hairstylist. I, I get it. What's the joke? I will. <laughs> say, I, I guess, I the only mediocre thing about it I'd say is. I guess Otter Tattoo is okay, but Susan Sarandon was pretty <laughs> shocked me a little bit. One for how good she looked at seventy three, but two, not that that, that should matter, but uh, I mean she was somewhat compelling for the five minutes she was in it, I guess. But I don't know. I don't was, know. Again, this this egotism, this awesome egotism that 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 her character and Audrey Tattoo are both just demonstrable of the high level egocentrism of John, John Turturro, that these women, all they want to do is just have sex with him. They just want to throw themselves at him. That's, that's all they're there for. In fairness, they want to have sex with a lot of people, specifically Audrey too. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that's, I mean, that, that goes back to the have Madison thing or just, right. you know, the, 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 the male fantasy of the right. woman who is the sexuality is completely free to everybody. Yeah, yeah. It's just if nothing else, it's boring as sin. And don't watch it if you haven't already. There's uh, no plot. There is absolutely no plot to this movie. Nothing happens. No, nobody learns anything uh, aside from kind of Audrey Tattoo. But what she learns is like it, it's really gross and un- unimpressive. Because <laughs> like, again, it's just part of this whole male fantasy. Yeah. Ah, uh, hate it. I hate this movie. Yeah, if you ever basically if you if a movie comes out that's a spin off remake, just stay away from it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes no sense. This, this does have this has nothing to do with the big Lebowski. I mean truly, because th- it this exists this is like uh John Turturro had a dream uh while he was on the set and that's how this is how it turned out. <laughs> to me it's more he wanted to remake going places and he thought I could use the Jesus character to do this and more people will see it and <laughs> I part of me thought maybe I should watch Going Places, but I don't really. I don't know. I don't want to watch Gerard Depardieu in this role either. <laughs> so I, I didn't even bother to look for it. Uh, no, d- neither did I. The, the <laughs> I mean, the, everything is so awkward. That 
that that walk-in scene walk even refers to him licking the bowling ball like we like remember remember that thing he did in the big lebowski where he licked a bowling ball well he did that you didn't see it but he did it okay <laughs> and it just sucked you know he gets all these people similar to a happy madison movie that show up to be in it uh because they want to be associated with either him or the lebowski or they were friends or whatever it is and it falls flat every time oh yeah all right let's have more fun ladies and gentlemen this is the main event for the linear legitimate and universally recognized undisputed classic and within five seconds of this movie, I forgot all about Jesus Rolls. Yes, dude. <laughs> it's amazing. I, uh, <laughs> I really needed this uh, because this is my favorite movie of all time. Uh, I still is, after, even after Jesus Rolls and watching it for the 44th, 45th time I've watched this movie. It's still just absolutely wonderful from beginning to end. The Big Lebowski is just for me. It's the perfect movie. It just the pace is perfect. The style is perfect. The dialogue, the the repeating dialogue. I I just I'm fascinated by it every time. I hear something new almost every time I watch this. I'll catch something I didn't catch before. That is something that gets stuck in the dude's head, and he's got to repeat it later on, or somebody else has mm-hmm. got to repeat it later on. It is this symphonic way of creating dialogue and rising and falling, and the the this almost musical quality to the way that they use words like just literally the word chinaman <laughs> it's, just, it's used like three times in the movie but it's it's so perfectly placed and then it comes back in a weird unexpected moment and it's just brilliant <laughs> i just everything about this movie is so good lebowski's uh, Je- jeff bridges's performance is just so pitch perfect and uh, he just that this character has existed forever <laughs> and right. it's just i it's so lived in it's so amazing I just can't even. <laughs> As it, a... <laughs> go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, well, it's it's just so because he's he's smart enough, but he's also a bumbling idiot. And then you talk about the dialogue and the delivery of the dialogue. It's almost like they're singing a song, but he stutters a lot and he doesn't know how to get the words out. And it, but it, I'd almost feel like that's all written. Every stutter, every pause, <laughs> it almost has to be. And it, it's just nailed perfectly. And I mean, you don't even really care what the story is. That's the yeah. brilliant part. It's and literally not a word that comes out of their mouth isn't entertaining or funny or whatever it needs to be in that moment. It's just a perfect movie. And like you said, every time you watch, you get something new. And I. Uh, I I, this time for me watching it this time i was watching philip seymour hoffman again and uh he's just he's brant is this such an unusual character though the the little ticks the little things this physical acting that he does the, jeff bridges is walking past these this wall of accolades for the for the big lebowski and he touches one and you just see you just see like his, his <laughs> asshole just, just goes tight like he just oh he's so mad but he can't say anything <laughs> <laughs> he does that throughout. He walks. He walks uh, the dude into the fu- into the fireplace room. So he's gonna. You know, so the big Lebowski is gonna lay out the plot about Bunny leaving. And you just see Brent like he's all sad. He's all sad. Okay, I've got a thing to do. <laughs> he stops and he hands him the paper. And then he goes just. Then he just goes limp, just standing there, just goes limp. And I'm just watching him throughout. Just these little physical things that he does. It doesn't take away from the scene. He's not pulling focus from anybody, but he's doing something funny. And everybody is doing something just quite just a little bit of business that's just perfectly pitched to the moment. Yeah, every character is doing something on this in the background, or something's going on that you just you can focus in on that person. I, I you know, you're it's easy to focus on Walter and the dude, but you know, even Donnie was every, all those things. I just kind of kept watching Donnie every time, and it, <laughs> it, 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 it's just so good. I, <laughs> The way the way Buscemi plays it, I mean, he's so innocent and so naive, and just he just accepts everything that happens to him, and it's so not like your typical Buscemi character. Buscemi has a big personality; he's a forceful kind of kind of guy. He kind of pushes his way into a scene uh, in most in most movies, and here he's just, he's so amazing at capturing Donnie and capturing Donnie's relationship in this in this trio 
that he's not a forceful person. He, he's he's just so sweet. <laughs> but you can't keep your and eyes off him. Huh? But you can't keep your eye. I mean, you're we're looking at the screen. You got three guys doing three totally different things, and you don't know where to watch. It's, <laughs> it's just phenomenal. It's almost like a choose your own adventure. You could just. <laughs> That's why it never gets old. I mean, that was something I noticed. Is you know when I usually have my phone around when I'm watching the movie, I try not to look at it. But I notice all of a sudden I'm like we're halfway through and I haven't looked at my phone yet. And I'm like, God damn it! I've seen this movie how many times? And I'm not even you know looking down once it's and i wasn't even on purpose it was just kind of naturally i didn't look down uh i just i don't know it is such a i i don't understand how this movie exists or where the i i mean i know the dude was based on a real person but other than that everything else i just don't know where that idea comes from you know, it's like Sergeant Pepper's, you know, where did they come up with this idea of this kind of an album? <laughs> where does that come from? I don't understand it. Is, it. it is, it's like a two hour, uh, two hour song. You can sing along to the big Lebowski. I mean, I do because I know every word, every, every line of dialogue in this movie. I know, and I can speak it along with the actors as they do it. Uh, it Cause it has that sort of musical quality to it. Uh, it's almost unnatural just how how quickly the dialogue uh, takes place, and yet it's so perfectly pitched and so per- perfectly placed. The editing is so crisp and so tight. Uh, it's this shaggy dog of a story is so much tighter than most other stories that try to be tight. <laughs> right. That's what's such a. It's two polar opposite things that polar opposite things at once. You know, such a loose story, but such a tight direction that it doesn't make sense how it <laughs> works so perfectly. And that's what makes it so compelling. And this is a movie that people didn't like right away because they couldn't wrap their head around it. And I don't know. It, it I, I'm glad we watched it. I mean, we could make this a classic every year. We probably will. <laughs> I think we've done it before. But, <laughs> oh, well, but I, I mean, after I knew... I kind of had a bad feeling about uh, the the Jesus rolls going in. I'm like, yeah. you know, what? need that. I need this to <laughs> to make that. Uh, if anything goes wrong with that, I've got this. <laughs> yeah, and it didn't. Even when he was on the screen, it didn't bring me back to. No, no. And I'm, I mean, Turo works way better in the Coen Brothers world than any other world, and. Uh, I mean, he definitely has talent, and the Coen Brothers have brought it out of him every time he's been on in every movie he's been in, but. It's almost as if he didn't understand the performance he was giving. Like, I, because if you watch the Jesus rules, you see him kind of take elements of that character that he thought were the character, like the licking the bowling ball, he thinks is a, an actual character trait when it's just a funny bit of business. Uh, <laughs> the, the Coke nail, he thinks it's a, that's. It's just a bit of business. It's just something to give this character, you know, a lot of color. He's well colored by the Coen brothers. And he just thinks that those collection of traits actually made up an actual character. And he totally misses it. He totally doesn't get what the character is uh, because the the character he creates for Jesus roles is not the same person. It doesn't even feel the same. Like he doesn't even have the same. uh, He's got a lot of the references to that character, but it's almost like he's not that character. Right. Yeah, it's, it's that's what's great is that the Coen brothers, that's why other movies they write that they don't direct never work because no one knows how, understands them. You know, they have to be the ones that translate it onto the screen or it just doesn't work. And and obviously they didn't write Jesus rules, thank God. Yeah. But uh <laughs> <laughs> characters based on their characters, but and then you got the Sam Elliott narr- narration, which I've never really seen anything like that before. He's literally just witnessing this from the bar, and that's why he's narrating it. And I guess kind of the Kurt Russell Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but even then, he's kind of a, a an important character to that movie, or not important, but he's a character in the movie. This yeah. is just a guy at the bar at the bowling alley <laughs> watching the story <laughs> unfold, so he narrates it. Ah just so perfect it is uh, i love that 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 uh that bit at the beginning where he lo- uh, he loses his train of thought he's the narrator of the show he <laughs> kind of trails off <laughs> so great 
Yeah. Only thing I don't like about this movie is I like the Eagles more than Credence Clearwater, but that's about it. I don't love the Eagles, by the way. I just hate Credence. <laughs> Except Fortunate Son. I'll take that song. Uh, yeah. Man, I, I love watching this movie. I'm glad I watched it again. I can't wait to watch it next time. <laughs> I, I, we haven't even got to the, like, Julianne Moore. I mean, the dialogue that they came up with for her and the, and the delivery that she goes with. A lot of times that can be like, you know, it's like uh, when Nicolas Cage and Con Air chooses a weird way of speaking or any movie that he's in. Like, he almost ruins Peggy Sue Got Married just by picking a weird voice that he wanted to do. Right. And that could be this, that you, Julianne Moore picking this very odd way of speaking could be uh, a fourth wall breaker. It could be something where you go like, why are you doing that? No, it's fucking perfect. She nails it. <laughs> She's absolutely, the character couldn't speak any other way. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Even the scene after they get done fooling around, you see her legs start to go backwards. <laughs> and you know what's happening. And you know the line's coming. But it's still it's just so subtle the way it's happening. And he's over there making his Caucasian. And <laughs> it's just, I don't know. The many times he spills that drink, too, is... Which and it's milk, which is so gross. <laughs> That's what's funny about it. Oh, <laughs> He's God. literally spilling milk all over this car, all over the room, spitting it out throughout the entire movie. I don't know. <laughs> ah, it's just so good, and it just kind of really phases good. out. It just kind of ends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No one's learned a lesson or come away with anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, it's almost like they're like, we're going to make a movie with kind of a weak story or a loose story, if nothing else. We're going to do everything that people hate, and we're going to make you like this movie. And that's what they do. <laughs> so, I mean, am I wrong? I mean, that's kind of what they're doing in a way. And it, I don't know, because they're so perfect at it, it makes it so much it's, better. It's, it's so ingenious. I mean, here take the Walter character alone, just the John Goodman. I mean, Walter turns out to be right. <laughs> it's all this asshole shit that he does. That he was right the whole time. <laughs> like this, kid, this is not the character who should be rewarded in any way. But <laughs> they reward him. Uh, oh, it's so great. <laughs> just even him breaking the car. I mean, <laughs> and you're looking for something subtle that, you know, that you can make your own or you can pull away and this is my line or whatever. But every line is so important and matters and is repeated. Like you said, you sing it like a song because you know every yeah. line. You can't find that. You can't even find the, the out there line that no one even thinks about because every line in this movie could be or like if you go to IMDb and look at the quotes, it's basically the script is on. The, it's pretty much there. <laughs> That's what this movie is. <laughs> oh man! Girlfriend gave up her toe. <laughs> I don't know why that was. Just... <laughs> oh God! Amy man, <laughs> Amy man, just randomly popping up. So good. Right. Just uh. I don't know. If you're one of the people that haven't seen it, watch it four times and tell me it's not your favorite movie or up there. It's true. Like I, I've told everybody, you've got to watch this movie at least three times before it, it hits you what you're what you're really watching. Yeah, when you're you know you're on your fifth or sixth time through and you're still as interested as you know the second or third. The first time you're kind of figuring out what you're watching, but yeah, it's it never gets old. It never gets you know I I don't know. Just, but it's also awesome if you can't go to bed watching because you'll just pay attention. You know, <laughs> like I could throw a Luther weapon on and just, you know, enjoy it and go to bed because it's like comfort food. This, I would stay awake and watch it. And that's what. <laughs> I, it's got an absolutely timeless quality to it. There, you, This could have this happened yesterday. I mean, there's nothing about this that, that dates it to 1998. Because this guy uh, would have a tape deck. <laughs> that's the thing. <laughs> You know, he would today. That's the kind of, yeah. that's why it does, it's not dated. Oh, God. Uh, Walkman, where he's listening to old bowling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it makes sense. <laughs> we all know a version of this guy, kind of. <laughs> Never as perfect as this guy, but 
I don't oh, know. I don't see too many Walters. That's my. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any likable versions of the dude, but I know people that are kind of like him, I guess. <laughs> I guess, uh, have you heard the story that, uh, that Walter is based on uh, John Milius, the uh, screenwriter? No. Yeah, apparently the, the guy who wrote Red Dawn, <laughs> wrote, I think he wrote, directed Dawn. Anyway, he's a really uh, right-wing reactionary type. <laughs> 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 he, was the, he was kind of the basis for, the dude, or for, for, the, uh, for Walter. And I know the dude's just some guy that walks around in Hollywood all the time. Or that, I mean, he's kind of a presence. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I don't know who that guy is either. But I'm sure they're all based on something. But I don't know. It's just uh, love it. All right, something else I don't love is Bird on a Wire, 1990. Oh, I hate Bird on a Wire. Just this was almost as miserable as as Jesus Rules. Really, this uh, is this- the anti Lebowski because there's no reason this should be bad. You got Mel Gibson in, in you know his prime, Goldie Hawn right around her prime, the peak of what they are, and this is just the most blah movie I've ever seen. It, yeah, it's just it's a nothing movie. There is nothing interesting. There's nothing that's uh, driving this. There's nothing funny about it. There's nothing romantic or sexy about it. And you've got two really attractive, uh, sexy people who should be able to be. Uh, interesting, at least at a, at a, on a surface level. Even then, uh, it, it's not particularly eye eye catching. Uh, the John Badham directed this, who's a pretty average director, and this story. I don't even know. Like a, Mel Gibson is a guy who ends up in the witness protection program in Detroit, and he's he's being erased by some evil FBI agent who, after his first FBI agent disappeared, and then Goldie Hawn, who's his ex, ex-fiance, who shows up in Detroit and happens upon him and happens to be there the night that he, the people who are looking for him find him and try to kill him. And I mean, why did we open on David Carradine and, and Bill Duke? What was the point of that? We, <laughs> the whole movie opens on them. They barely exist throughout. They're there just to to show up for, for, for gunshots uh, at certain points to, to like, I guess create some danger and then then they're just like the whole movie starts on them as if this is the most important information you need for this movie and it's not yeah like David Carradine's feet and Bill Bill Duke's uh, car these are the important things you need to know about that's the first two images of the movie and it's like this is not you're 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 completely off off your base here yeah it's just uh, another weird thing about this movie is like this it's not like Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn are particularly bad. They actually kind of have chemistry, but the movie, the they can't even, they do nothing with it. They can't make a movie. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know what they're trying to do. This is such a bad piece of directing and writing that you can't really blame anybody but that. And it is so just disappointing and depressing in a lot of ways because there's no reason this should be dumb <laughs> why is it called bird on a wire what is bird on a wire is this a, a form of slang that uh, that was popular in the late 80s early 90s i don't remember i have, I have no, no idea. idea what this title is referring to i don't know either all i know and is that there's stuff. nothing there's nothing to reference it in the movie itself they never reference anything remotely and they, i don't even think there's a fucking bird in the movie <laughs> 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 some sort of visual reference. I, I don't understand what that... I'm sure there's, to somebody it makes sense, but in the context of the movie, they don't really give you an idea. And I know it's the least important thing in the world, probably, but I... It was just I was I had nothing else to focus on the movie. The movie is so terrible that I kept thinking about what does... So where are they going to explain Bird on a Wire? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when movie has you thinking that, then it know it, you know it's failed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, God, I would. I tried to watch this. What? Go ahead. Good. The action isn't any good. The the t- the two lead performers have no chemistry. The, there's nothing romantic. I disagree with that. I think they have chemistry. I just don't think they use it. I, I they, they don't. I because I did, I really didn't feel like I saw much of it because it's just all running around and uh, Mel Gibson's butt for a little bit, and that's pretty much. <laughs> I yeah. what else? I don't know. Oh, it's a Leonard Cohen song. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, great. 
inspired by a bird sitting on one of the Hydra's recently installed phone wires, followed by memories of a wet island night. Huh. Don't know why that's part of the movie, but... (laughs) Yeah, it it is a complete dud. Don't ever watch this movie. Ever. (laughs) (laughs) I'm amazed it didn't ruin careers, to be honest with you. Maybe it ruined the directors. I don't know. I don't know. John Badham pretty much uh, he never made a good movie so I'm kidding I, Saturday, he made Saturday Night Fever I think he's not completely awful but this movie is just it's so it, it's badly directed enough that it makes me question everything else he's ever done well just the fact that the script got to the point where it was a movie I don't know unless they changed something I, I really don't know what they would have done unless they just said hey let's just show Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn's butt and then we'll have a blockbuster I don't know if that's what they were I, going for, or what? It definitely feels very, very uh, butt fa- butt based. This movie is very, very hap- is very excited about butts. <laughs> Which I'm okay with, but that shouldn't be the only <laughs> thing the movie is going for. He's the director of a Short Circuit, Blue Thunder, Stakeout, and Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever is the only great movie he made. Short Circuit's fine. Stakeout's bad. Oh, man, I liked Stick Out when I was a kid. I'm afraid to go back and watch it now. Or no, I liked another Stick Out. <laughs> but again, you're talking about a 14-year-old, so I don't know. Uh, let's go back to something good. It's nice to have something that always fixes the thing before it, uh, Cadillac yeah. Man. <laughs> and I definitely did not expect this to 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 fix uh, the problems with, that I had with Burn on a Wire, but this movie was a, a, was a revelation for me. Uh, and here we got a director uh, in uh, his last name is McDonald. I, I can't remember his first name, but uh, he's not a guy who is very distinguished. You look at his career. He's not directed a good movie other than this. Uh, Roger McDonald. Uh, this is Robin Williams as a car car salesman who's a sleazy. He's uh, separated from his wife. He's got multiple different women, uh, one of whom's cheating on her husband with him. Uh, he's just got a lot of self-created problems that are basically a, an extension of his own ego. Uh, he ends up in this hostage situation after uh, Tim Robbins comes busting into the car dealership where he works to uh, confront his wife, played by Annabella Shiora, because she's sleeping with one of the guys in the in the dealership. And Robin Williams, through this, kind of assumes the situation as, okay, it was me. It wasn't anybody else. I was the one who was sleeping with her. So he takes it all on himself. And He's doing this as a way of trying to save people's lives, which is so not what you expect of this character. And that's sort of the beginning of this, not necessarily a turn, like he's not becoming a better person. It's almost demonstrating who he's always been, but that he's buried behind this wall of of bullshit. This all uh, this life of just trying to be this surface level person that that uh, everybody seems to want him to be, and he thinks he wants to be, but in reality, he's over, always been covering up for this good person that he's always been. And he reveals himself over this over the last half of the movie. He's revealing what a actually genuinely good person that he always was, and that is such an interesting way to take this performance because the first 40 minutes of the movie are setting up what a what a shithead he is you know (laughs) all the bad thing that he's done and you think that this guy's sleazy and he has no soul and then the last half of the movie is him demonstrating the depth of this character the depth of this person that he's always been and is now just kind of bringing about to the rest of the world it's a wonderful performance and i really didn't expect it i i really didn't have any a solid memory of this movie, but watching him develop and that, especially in that second half, even throughout the movie, I think, it, I think the whole movie works. Even though Roger Ebert says it's only half of a good movie because he didn't like the first half. I think you have to have that first half and kind of set up the emptiness, the soullessness, the, the desperation, the sweaty desperation of Robin Williams to have this mean so much when he turns or it doesn't again, not turns, but like he just reveals himself. He, he, he's, he strips away everything to reveal who he really is. And it's fascinating and wonderful. And it's just, it's maybe up there among my favorite Robin Williams performances. Yeah. And you could even like, I think it even works in the opposite way where, cause you kind of have to come to your own conclusion in a way you have to buy into it being real or it being an act. Cause they never really tell you one way or the other, <laughs> but it works both ways. I think, I, I think it works if he's just being a sleazy sales guy and it pisses you. I mean, it, 
and it works and it works as of him revealing himself either way i think however you take this movie it it works and i don't know i i the movie stressed me out it was exhausting uh you compared it to uncut gems and i'd almost say it's like if uncut gems was the first 40 minutes of this movie and then when he gets you know, his, his comeuppance or whatever you want to call it at the end that's the hostage situation here and it takes off from there i it is just it, it is something else uh i highly recommend going back and checking it out because robin williams engulfs this role i mean he is this guy uh you lose track of the robin williams that you see in uh on you know on talk shows and whatnot that guy is not here it is he is this character, Joey, whatever. I can't remember his last name. Yeah. Uh, it is so perfect. And Tim Robbins comes in. And the weird thing is I work at this place where I kind of have the Joey character. <laughs> and then I got the Tim Robbins character as another sales guy. And who's kind of a goofball. Not totally there. And <laughs> so that, I got to experience a little bit different with this. Yeah. You know, having people like those two. Uh, it is... Man, I don't know. I, to me, rather than just showing that he's a good person, it was literally everything was going to fall apart that day anyway. And yeah. he had nothing left to lose. So he was almost trying to save his job by doing this. And uh, in the process, you know, I, I believe he was being genuine because uh, you kind of see him change. It was all instinct. And because of that, you know, you have to be genuine when you're dealing off of instinct. And it's just fascinating. And him and Tim Robbins' chemistry was great. Them going out and negotiating with the <laughs> FBI and the cops uh, was fun. The Chinese restaurant across the street was funny. I, everything about it was just really, really good. Really well yeah, put together. I mean, it's, it's a comedy, I guess. But one of the things about it is that I, I didn't laugh a lot, but I was so in engaged and just i was well into this that uh there are a few laughs and they're big uh here and there but i i really wasn't caring so much about whether or not i was getting comedy or not right and i think i think at the time maybe people didn't see uh the performance that robin williams is giving because they want to see robin williams be robin williams and off the handle and over the top and he's being fast he's speaking quickly you know he's yeah being, there's a fire fiery pace to what he's doing but he's not he's staying within the realm of this character. And that is the, the key here is that he never, he never uh, goes over the top into Robin Williams shtick. He sticks with this character and, and invests himself within this character and makes that character real uh, instead of just relying on the old Robin Williams uh, manic energy. But this, the, the movie is relentless. The pace never stops, even from the first scene to the last. It even builds. the scene where before the, before the, before the uh, hostage situation, the movie is moving at a very fast clip to, to reveal who he, the situation that he's in. He needs to sell a bunch of cars to keep his job. He, his daughter is missing. His ex-wife hates him. He's got a girlfriend who, in Fran Drescher who's cheating on her rich husband. Uh, he's in debt to the mob. He's got another much younger mistress played by Lori Petty, who's uh, you know driving him crazy, but he wants her because she's you know youthful and sexy, and and all this stuff really needs to end. All that stuff nearly needs to go away for him to actually find a place where he can be happy. And this almost thing that ha this happens to him. It's almost the perfect time for this to happen to him. Right. And then <laughs> he's kind of grateful to Tim Robbins' character. <laughs> Yeah. So so much so that I, I feel like that's the reason he tells him at the end he never slept with Donna was because he, he was oh. grateful to him. It wasn't to piss him off. It was to let him know, hey, we I really do. I don't know. <laughs> it was almost to set him at ease. Uh, but this, this movie does a good job of the way I like the way it starts because it does. That's the closest thing to the Robin Williams character you get, you know, the, the, the easy win where he's trying to sell a Cadillac to a, a grieving widow during the, you know, the ride where they're funeral taking procession. what the funeral, oh, the funeral procession. procession. Yeah, they I mean, that scene, it's funny. That's probably the funniest part of the movie, I guess. But it's also the more typical part of the that that's where you get most of that Robin Williams energy. And then it. It kind of let it sets you in, gets you at ease, and then it just takes you in this direction, and you got to hold on for the 
ride and it is exhausting it is stressful it is but at the same time it is it, it is entertaining it's a hell of a movie yeah, Robin Williams is just amazing. He just draws you into him. He, he almost he sells you on this character just as he's selling everybody else on himself and selling them cars and just selling in general. But he, he just he draws you to him in a in the way that in that kind of classically Robin Williams way that he is just so insanely charismatic. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Like we were talking before about Turturro and about. Uh, uh, about Spade, how they how they're not traditionally attractive guys, and yet women in movies throw themselves all over him. I would buy for everything that Robin Williams could get any one of these women. Oh, yeah. This movie establishes a personality within this guy that is engaging. That is the kind of thing that that would draw a woman to him. I you you buy it because the character invests you with that idea. Oh, definitely. I yeah. And then you got the all the women in this movie are fantastic. Like I'm. I kind of only know Fran Drescher as the nanny. I, so not, you know, seeing her in a movie like this was definitely weird for me. I was like, because she's really good. Annabelle Escura is really, really good. Lori Petty's great. They're all, they all make it make sense. It, it is such a, every performance matters. And even the over the top ones don't take you out of the movie. Uh, I don't know. It, it's kind of a, I don't know if I liked it as much as you did because, like, I don't know if you're putting it ahead of Goodfellas already or you're just talking about what you've seen so far in 1990. What we've seen so far of 1990, this is my the favorite thing. It surpassed uh, Ninja Turtles as my favorite movie of the <laughs> okay. year. I, I wasn't sure how I translated that tweet. <laughs> so, okay, that makes more <laughs> sense. But I, I I love this movie a lot. I and I because it's so unexpected and I, and it hits upon a theme that has always been very big for me. I've talked about it on the show before about about compassion, about a character who, who demonstrates uh, a depth, a, a, a wealth of compassion. And I think there is that, I think that's what we find about Robin Williams' character, Joey, is that he reveals himself to be a deeply compassionate person. As much as he has this soulless side where he's you know, desperate and, and scared and wanting to, you know, desperately must sell cars and will do anything to do it. He's got this kind of, uh, you know, go for broke mentality in that way. He has this behind that is this wealth of actual genuine care for other people, you know, the, the chivalry, like the first thing he suggests is let the women go. And I know that's kind of a cliche, but at the same time for this guy to, I mean, other movies would have this character use a woman as a, as a human shield. <laughs> right. you know? The similar character would be, would be have to, his lesson would be learning to care about other people as opposed to he right away. The first thing he does is take it upon himself to have the gun pointed at him as opposed to anybody else. And he was the selflessness that he shows in that moment, regardless of where it's coming from, it's coming from a, an arrogant place where he thinks he can talk this right. situation out. But at the same time, it also reveals something about him, uh, a, a selflessness, a willingness to throw himself in front of the, in front of the gun. You imagine this, that if the situation were Tim Robbins comes in and actually starts shooting people, he'd be the one to run at him. And try and tackle him like that's the kind of person that he would reveal himself to be instinctually. And again, Robin Williams is just amazing at revealing this character throughout through dialogue and action. It's uh, it's an incredible performance. Well, yeah, he literally uses himself as a human shield at the end for for uh, Tim Robbins character as yeah. they're walking out. And uh, I don't know. It is just. Uh, It'll definitely be one I go back to again because I, I did not expect it to be this powerful and good. And uh, I, mean, I don't I know. Really, yeah, I, I, I've seen this movie before, but I didn't remember liking it. And I think I was, I was back at a time when I was also reading a lot of Roger Ebert and kind of take, taking in what Robert, Roger Ebert uh, would say as sort of the uh, as gospel. Right. And so perhaps that influenced my opinion of it early on. Uh, seeing it now, all these years later, and of course, you know, with Robin Williams gone, it it changes my perspective of this movie a great deal because I'm obviously there's the nostalgia, the uh, the grief, uh, missing what Robin Williams was uh, was was capable of, what he demonstrated on screen. Uh, right. That, that that aspect is there, but also you're seeing this performance, this incredible performance that is, ah, oh, it's just so good. <laughs> it's just such a great performance. Well, another cool thing about it is, especially 
specific to you and I is we've always kind of we don't dig into it much because sometimes it gets heated. But you know, we're always the the good and the bad of people. This both are demonstrated within this character. I, I think everybody's got a little good in, and bad in them, regardless of who they are, whether it's you know the worst person in the world or the best person in the world. There's something bad about them or something good about them, and this character you see both evenly throughout this movie and sometimes you got to decide yeah. if it's good or bad and uh i it, it's just such a perfect balance and uh i don't know i i just i was just so shocked and i i just go see it it's on was it on amazon or was it on like showtime or stars i can't remember what it was but i didn't pay for it i don't think <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's on the Stars app, I believe, is where it is, or where people can see it. Uh, Roger Donaldson, uh, the director here, I I have to give most of the credit I think to Robin Williams for creating this. Donaldson's career uh, is notable for he directed No Way Out, Cocktail, right. Getaway, Species, Dante's Peak, The Recruit, The Bank Job's a good movie. November Man's a terrible movie. Uh, it's a I think I. He's capable of this, I guess, but I, I have to say that I think I think most oh, much yeah. of this comes down to Robin Williams's performance. Oh, it's definitely it's definitely the performances. Robin Williams mainly. Tim Robbins is okay. The girls were great. Uh, some of the other characters were a little over the top, which if it wasn't for Robin Williams, could have taken you out of the movie. Uh, so I no, I, I agree completely. He he. I agree. I think with those other over the top characters, though, I think they're there. I think the intent of those characters is to be on all the time and to make you anxious. I think that's what like the cab driver family, the, the husband and wife cab yeah. drivers, uh, Fred Drescher, uh, they, they have all this manic energy going on to them uh, that, that they're there to create this cacophony that is inside Robin Williams's head that he must escape. <laughs> no, I agree completely. I just think if he doesn't pull it off that takes you out of the movie and because he pulls off what he does, but no, you're, you're right. The, the angst of that scene just before Tim Robbins even arrives with the <laughs> gun, there's this scene taking place where he's got two customers, this husband and wife, foreigners, uh, cab drivers. They want to buy a new car and they've got cash and they're yelling and screaming. And then Fran Drescher and her husband come in. <laughs> and of course, Fran Drescher is the woman he's been sleeping with on the side. Uh, so he's there, and she's got this little dog, and the dog is yapping, and then his boss is trying to let another deal walk out the door. That that guy is yelling, and there's, everybody's screaming, and Robin Williams is at the center of it, and there's and the camera is moving like this tornado of cuts going on right. from all these characters who are screaming. The anxiety is so high, and then crash, boom, right through the window comes Tim Robbins with a gun and, and breaks this moment up. And it's it actually <laughs> it releases the tension room with a gun. It actually relieves the tension. Yeah. And you forgot about the wife calling because the daughter's miss- or the ex-wife calling because his yeah. daughter's missing <laughs> when all that's going on. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I love this movie. Yeah. Great. Go see it. Uh, it is available uh, next week. Uh, next for 1990, we have Back to the Future 3 and Firebirds. But we're going to spend some time digging into Lynn Shelton's career. The classic, the classic's going to be Hump Day. Uh, we're going to watch her newest movie, Sword of Trust, and possibly more depending on time and uh, what's going on. And then, obviously, the Dark Side of the Ring, Owen Hart part story. Uh, so that'll be next week. Uh, don't forget to go to – or go ahead. Your, your, your family didn't make you watch Scoob? I don't think they know about it yet. <laughs> Nobody tell them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen to the show. Uh, uh, but yeah, go to also if you want to help support the podcast, patreon.com slash critics pod or I hate critics.com. Click on the Patreon or T public link to get some merch or support us on Patreon. Uh, do you have time for flick shirt? Absolutely. What else are you going to do? <laughs> We're on lockdown. <laughs> Uh, I like the way this starts. Patch Adams or Showgirls? <laughs> all, showgirls all the way. Robin Williams loses. Oh, man. That what he does, yeah. Hugo Fargo. Uh, Fargo. Yeah. Cinderella Man Machete. Cinderella Man. Greed. P- 
Pillow Talk, 1959, or Bucket of Blood, 1959? I don't think I've seen Bucket of Blood. All right. Pillow and Talk. You've probably not seen Pillow Talk, right? I have not. So I'll just refresh all together. Ray or Lord of the Rings, Return of the King? Ray. Did you see what Jason uh, Mollett posted for having sex with Peter Jackson? <laughs> I kind of vaguely glanced at it. Oh my god, it's amazing! It's like after the first, just, she just, at first she's really interested uh, at everything he did, and then after a while, by the time they do it the third time, she's like, "I, I get it. I'm not interested anymore." <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Uh, let's see here. We got one hour photo, Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers. Oh, it's one hour photo. Yeah, that's uh, another great, uh, another great performance by, by by Robin Williams. Yeah, Iron Man two thousand eight: A History of Violence. History of Violence. It's a better movie, I, but I, I love watching Iron Man. I agree. Uh, seven pounds, red eye. Red eye. I I think I hated Seven Pounds. <laughs> I think. <laughs> very possible Avengers Age of Ultron The Expendables Avengers yeah even though that's the one I don't like but Expendables sucks you've got male broken arrow <laughs> Jesus Christ I I, uh, I have this ironic appreciation of, the, of broken arrow that goes well beyond having seen it um uh, uh, you've got males a better movie. Yeah, I was gonna say that as well. It's gonna make you flip if you didn't go that way. <laughs> I, I, I can't defend it the way I enjoy broken. Well, I can't defend the way I like because I enjoy it kind of like a mystery science theater enjoyment. Right, I enjoy laughing at it. <laughs> yeah, Thor: The Dark World, Die Hard. Oh, it's Die Hard, absolutely. Die Hard's the best action movie ever made. I like Lethal Weapon better, but it's fair enough. Uh, the Manchurian Candidate, 2004, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Yeah. Child's Play, The Passion of the Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Which, let's see, uh, torture porn or child's play? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the second best torture porn movie beside, behind Saw. <laughs> or is it the eighth best beside, behind the other seven songs? <laughs> Uh, Passion of the Christ is a middle finger to Mel Gibson. Uh, <laughs> a child play, I mean. Oh, I'm going Passion. I'll f- flip it. Passion wins. Darn it. That's, at least it's a, I don't know. <laughs> Child's play sucks too, so I mean, I, right. I'm losing either way. I don't think Passion sucks. It's just, it's torture porn about Jesus. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love the fact that he doesn't understand that that's all it is. Yeah. And people who like it. But it works on that level. I mean, I, I don't know. Secret of the Nim, you only live twice. I don't think I've seen Secret of Nim. I, I'm sure I have, but I would have been like three or four. <laughs> uh, Shallow Hal, or you only live twice. Shallow Hal. Agreed. The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford or Crimson Tide? Ooh, that's that's tough. Crimson Tide I have a lot of appreciation for. But, uh, that, that, that other movie is a really good movie. Um, <laughs> Don't want to say the title because it <laughs> takes too much time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the Jesse James movie. It's Yeah, Brad Pitt's really great in that. Yeah, I agree. The Hangover Part 2, Stand By Me. Hangover 2, I just stand by me is okay. Yeah, I agree. Catwoman 2012. Uh, man, I hate both those movies. Um, uh, which one do I hate less? I, I, I think Catwoman's unintentionally funnier. So. I also think Catwoman knew it wasn't is good. I think Catwoman knew kind of what it was more so than 2012 did. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go Catwoman. 
Any Given Sunday, Lost in Translation. Lost in Translation. The Kentucky Fried Movie, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. (laughs) 